Our God and our Father, we bless your name because we have the privilege of coming right into your presence through the blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you because we have access to you through the name of Jesus Christ. And we thank you because your word is full to supply all the needs of our lives for time and for preparation for eternity. We're asking that as we come to your table tonight to study your word, you'll feed us to satisfaction in Jesus' name. Amen. We may not all know what we need spiritually, but you know the need, and we're asking that what you will teach us will supply the need in Jesus' name. Amen. Guide us by your spirit through the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Please open with me to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, the long and the wonderful chapter we're studying at present. This is the message recorded from the answer of Stephen before the council. As I've told you before and as I read to you from the scriptures, from Acts chapter 6, he had been accused of blasphemy against God, against Moses, against the temple, and against the law. And it was a serious charge. And it was brought before the council. And they wanted to know from him whether these things were true or not. And as Stephen opened his mouth to talk to the council, we find him doing something that all the other apostles invariably did whenever they were called to give a public entrance. Now you will realize that the message of Stephen before the council was full of the Old Testament scriptures. He quoted from Genesis, from Exodus, from Deuteronomy, from the book of the prophets. He just went everywhere and all he was doing was to bring up the climax of Jesus Christ the Messiah. Now let me say something about that, the use of the Old Testament. You know there are people that have nothing to do with the Old Testament, they feel that all we need for our redemption, all we need for our salvation, all we need for even our glorification, you'll find in the New Testament. They want to cut away the new from the old. They do not want to realize the use and the necessity of the study of the Old Testament. But you know that that is not a strange or new thing. As you read in church history, you'll find that there was a man that was born in the second century, just about a hundred years, not up to that, but almost about a hundred years after Stephen. And his name was Martian. You know, he said the church should not even concern itself with the Old Testament. And he said Christ, the Christ of the New Testament, had little or nothing to do with the Old Testament. He will cut away Christ from Israel. He'll cut away the Messiah from uh, the plan of God from the Old Testament. And eventually, in fact, in uh, 139 AD, he compiled a system of scriptures of the New Testament. And he removed everything that had reference to the events and to the actions of God in the Old Testament. He talked about Jesus, he talked about every other thing, but then he removed every reference to the Old Testament. And in the compilation of the scriptures that he brought forth, well, you will understand, Acts chapter 7 was removed because he did not want to associate Christ or salvation or the new covenant with the Old Testament. In fact, you know what the church will do. The church just branded him an heretic and sent him out of the church, excommunicated him. But even though he was excommunicated, the idea is still prevalent today in the minds of some people who are not studying the Bible. But you see, if you study the Bible from the time of the birth of Jesus Christ, the people were looking to the Old Testament for the fulfillment of a promise. Because all those promises they were referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, they were looking forth to the Lord Jesus Christ coming as uh, the little children were killed because the, um, Herod did not want to have Jesus Christ again. The Old Testament was quoted when the women were weeping for the children that were killed. 
And you know that when Jesus came forth and John the Baptist had to announce his coming, you know that the fulfillment of the ministry of John the Baptist again dated back to the Old Testament. And as Jesus continued his ministry, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed, preaching the gospel to the poor, everything he did, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they always referred back to the Old Testament. Even when he was tried, when he was crucified, when he rose from the dead, everything came as a fulfillment of what had been written in the Old Testament. And in fact, his second coming is all written in the Old Testament. The Bible is one, Old Testament and New Testament. In fact, the Old Testament is the cradle in which the New Testament is born and also developed. You know, the, old, the New Testament developed from the Old Testament. And to fully understand the Old, you need the New. And to fully appreciate the New, you need the Old. They are all together like the two hands of a man, the two eyes of a man, the two legs of a man, the two kidneys of a man. You can't function without the two together. Neither can you really understand the plan of God without the two, the Old and the New Testament. Now, Stephen has done a marvelous job. And in giving his answer, his address to the council, he showed the necessity of the Old Testament. I've read this to you before, but let's just have a feel of the knowledge, the appreciation of this man for the Old Testament. I'm reading Acts chapter 7 from verse 1. Acts chapter 7 from verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? And he said, Men, brethren, fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Charan, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Charan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much, as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession, and to his seed after him, when, he, when as yet he had no child. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that he should bring them, they should uh, bring them into bondage and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac. And circumcised him the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. And delivered him out of all his afflictions. And gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a death over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and great affliction. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him. And all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. So Jacob went now into Egypt and died, he and our fathers, and were carried over into Shechem, and laid in the sepulchre that Abraham brought, but for a sum of money, of the sons of Emom, the father of Sychem. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God adds one to Abraham. The people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. Now, let's stop there. Now, in all that I've read to you, you'll see how he systematically 
went from Genesis chapter 12 and he went on through to Genesis chapter 50. You can't read all that now, but he just uh, brought out verses and uh, ideas and the message from the book of Genesis. Now, authorities in Greek and authorities in uh, the Septuagint version, they have told us that as he was speaking, there were times he quoted directly from the Greek edition of the Old Testament, which was interpreted into Greek from Hebrew in um, 250 BC. And, uh, you know, this Stephen, he was really saturated with the Old Testament, with the Word of God, and without any preparation whatever, he just began to tell the history of the children of Israel, telling them that God had been on the throne every time. God had been in control of everything. And now, you know, they accused him that he did not believe in God. He blasphemed against God. He said, no, I believe in God, the God of Abraham, so he mentioned him. The God of Isaac, so he mentioned Isaac. And the God of Jacob, so he mentioned Jacob. And then he said, not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I believe in the God of glory. And I told you before that means is the God of power, the God who is glorious in holiness, majesty. His name is also glorious, and is glorious in wondrous works. And now he wants to talk about Moses because they accused him that um, he had blasphemed against Moses. And you know that when he crossed from talking about God to talking about Moses, they did not interrupt him. Because they accepted everything he said about God. Because he traced the events in the history of the children of Israel. And he said, well, you check it up. This is the God I believe in. The God of glory. The God who called Abraham, the God who promised him the land, the God who gave him the covenant of circumcision, the God who promised him Isaac, and the God who gave um, Jacob to Isaac, and the God who gave the twelve patriarchs to Jacob, that's the God I believe in. Which one are you standing for? And they couldn't talk because they knew that he was not a blasphemer because he believed firmly, wholeheartedly in the God that they also believed in. But now he must move on. To talking about Moses. And you see how he brought Moses in? You see how he talked about the birth of Moses, his childhood, the challenge of the life of Moses, the call of Moses, and also the commission that Moses received, as well as the conquest. And uh, that's what we want to see tonight. And in all this, we see God in heaven. Now, pay attention. Let me talk to the preachers. I told you before that when we are trained in preaching, those who train us either through books or cassettes or we go to Bible school, now we're told that whenever we preach, there is something we must do. We must keep the message scriptural yet interesting to capture the attention of the people. And you will see that with all respect, he addressed the people of the council. Men, brethren, fathers, what a great respect. And while he was talking, he identified with them. He said, our father Abraham. The patriarchs, our fathers, the twelve. And he talked about Abraham and the patriarchs in such a way that he showed that he was an Israelite. Listen to me. When you are preaching the gospel, it is not necessary for you. In fact, it is wrong for you to go against your nation. Now, you are a Nigerian also. You are a Christian. And when you are preaching the gospel anywhere, over the radio, over the television, in the newspapers, or you are preaching in the bus, there is no necessity to go against your country. You identify with your nation. If there is problem in the nation, you identify. You see how, how Stephen was talking? Our father Abraham. And he called him to dwell in this land where we dwell. And, uh, you know, he, he gave a birth to Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. You see how he respected the leaders in Israel, even the leaders who have died. That is why if you are really properly trained as a preacher, when you are preaching, anywhere you are preaching, on a crusade field or in the bus, you never, never, never speak any derogatory thing against your nation. You don't have to. And against the leaders, even the leaders that have died. 
and the leaders that are, you know, that are no more leaders, but you know, they're still, uh, they're still alive. And then the leaders that are there today, all you are told to do in scripture is to pray for the leaders. Now, you see the respect apart from that. He talked about God. And uh, something is wonderful here. Even though he had answered the uh, address, he had answered uh, the accusation uh, about blasphemy against God, now he was talking about Moses. Listen to me. He still kept on talking about God. You know, he has talked about God. They are all convinced. That point is settled. But then he's talking about Moses and he still keeps on mentioning the name of God in relationship to Moses. Now, in preaching, when you have made point one and you are making point two, you don't make your point two to contradict point one. You make your point two to strengthen and to emphasize the point one you made before. Now you say, why am I talking like this? Look up here. All our leaders in Nigeria now, the majority of them, they went from Monday Bible study. Our state representatives, you know they didn't attend Bible college, theological school. Their training came as a result of just regularly, regularly attending Monday Bible study. And uh, that's why we teach in the Monday Bible study, line upon line, precept upon precept, and we teach everything we need to teach because you are sitting down today in the pew. You are going to be standing tomorrow on the pulpit. Today you are listeners, but tomorrow you are going to be speakers. So that's why we, we clear up everything because we don't know what God wants to make you tomorrow. Uh, you might just uh, tomorrow, uh, I don't mean tomorrow, Tuesday. You understand what I mean by tomorrow? Okay. Now, uh, tomorrow you might just be at the stadium. Don't look down upon yourself. Because, you know, the Lord may be giving you a call. You might have known the call already, but you may not be ready at present. You are still being trained. So that is why I'm going through all this very slowly. And I'm saying that when you are making point number two, you don't contradict point number one. By making point two, you strengthen point one. You emphasize point one, and you still carry along in point one. And uh, by the time you come to your fourth point, you have not contradicted point one, point two, or point three. You are strengthening everything you said before. And then uh, you will realize that uh, whenever I come on here, I link you up with what we studied before. Now, why do we do that? Now, you see that in the message of Stephen. Actually, Stephen was going to talk about Jesus Christ because that is the essence of his message. But even though he was going to talk about Jesus, listen to me, they didn't know Jesus. They felt that Jesus Christ was an imposter, that what uh, Jesus Christ came to do was way off the point. And we preachers and teachers are told, you must go from what is already known and accepted to before you go to what is not known, what is not accepted. You see, they didn't accept Jesus Christ. They didn't accept he, accept he was a Messiah and a Christ. Therefore, he went from what they knew, what they accepted. What did they know? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. So he started from the God of glory who called our father Abraham. And then he went on. He's now going to talk about Moses. But the climax is going to be now. He's driving his point home until uh, you come to the Lord Jesus Christ. And then you don't irritate the people you are preaching to. You don't abuse them. Uh, you don't uh, tell them things they will reject at the beginning of the message. Very slowly, very patiently, you build up. And now, that's what Stephen was doing. Now, let's see how he did it. And it was so wonderful. In um, Acts chapter 7. Now, we're reading from verse 19. The same dealt subtly with our kindred. And evil entreated our fathers. You see the identification? Our fathers. Not your fathers. So that they cast out their young children. To the end, they might not live. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fear. And nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her 
for our own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. Now, as he talked about Moses, because they accused him of blasphemy, he was very, very careful in what he said about Moses. I told you last week, there were negative things you could say about anybody. Anybody. Now, listen to me very well. Negative things you could say about Abraham when he told a lie and said Sarah was not his wife but just his sister. That's negative. You could capitalize on it when you are preaching. And there were negative things you could say, you could say about uh, Moses, how he killed an Egyptian, how he was impatient, how he ran ahead of God. There were negative things you could say about David, how he just uh, committed adultery and killed the husband of uh, that woman and eventually married. What a bad, bad thing that, Mo that uh, David did. There were negative things we could say about Elijah, how he ran away from Jezebel and was saying, oh God, come and kill me. There were negative things we could say about almost anybody in the Old Testament. But look up here. Do you realize that even Jesus Christ when talking to the children of Israel, never, never, never mentioned those negative things. And he talked about, he talked about David and just overlooked the adultery. You do remember that when um, the apostles, when they talked about David and they called him a prophet and a king, they just overlooked the adultery. Why? Is it because we are not to learn from, oh no, we are to learn from them. But when you are talking to an audience, you never mention a point that will directly irritate them about their forefathers. And that is why if you are really preaching according to the New Testament, when you are talking to uh, some people who are idol worshippers, you don't abuse their fathers. You don't abuse their forefathers, even though their fathers and forefathers may be idol worshippers. You don't directly just irritate them so that they just take stones and begin to stone you. You want to preach in a way that you are drawing their attention to the Christ of the Bible. So that is the reason that Stephen, even though there were negative things he could mention, he did not mention them. Now, look up here. I've sometimes heard of people that go on the bus and they say they are preaching and while they are preaching they will go against the Catholics go against the Muslims go against everybody now they will be angry do you know that when somebody is angry his ears are blocked he doesn't hear what you are saying he doesn't see you as a preacher he sees you as um, a heretic as somebody who should not be listening to and um, if he's really angry he'll begin to talk and his voice will be louder than your voice now what have you done you have irritated him you don't preach like that in the boss and you don't preach like that anywhere now listen to me even when you are talking to an individual apart from a congregation an individual outside you meet a sinner take for example a prostitute now what do you do you know this a prostitute, you want her to repent, you want her to yield her life to the Lord. Uh, what do you do? Do you just say, well, uh, here I come, holy, holy, good, good, goody, goody. I'm just coming from heaven, I'm an angel. Now you prostitute, I'm telling you, if you don't repent, you'll go to hell. We don't preach like that. That shows that uh, you're a new convert. That shows you've not been reading the Bible. You know, Jesus Christ just came before the well and said, Woman, give me water to drink. Asking a prostitute water to drink. And the woman said, How can I give you water to drink? And Jesus said, If you know who is asking you for water, you will give him water and then he will give you, when you ask, the water of life. And you will thirst no more. And the woman said, eh, eh, Give me that water. And Jesus said, Well, I'll give you but uh, Go and call your husband. And the woman had no husband. I was just a public uh, woman. 
But Jesus did not directly say, now you prostitute, repent, otherwise you go to hell. We don't preach like that. Are you following me? Now, that's the same thing Stephen is doing. And if you check up in your New Testament very well, you'll see that there was a clean approach. You'll see that there was a loving approach. Yes, we'll talk about sin. Yes, we'll say that sin is evil. And sin will take a person to hell. But at the right time, when the people are listening, and you never do it to insult anybody. You must never insult your father, your mother, or the, your relatives, or people in your village. When you say you are preaching the gospel, let's preach according to the New Testament. Now, let's go on. Now, he talked about Moses. And he talked about the protection in childhood. How the Lord protected Moses. And how from that, he goes to the perception of his call. Acts chapter 7, verse 23. And when he was 40 years old, it came into his sight to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. You see the way he put it? He didn't say, well, you know that when Moses was 40 years of age, he became a murderer. At that time, they will stop him. He said he defended an Israelite and they loved that and then he smote the Egyptian for he supposed his brethren would have understood how God how that God by his son would deliver them but they understood not and the next day showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again saying sirs ye are brethren why do ye wrong one to another? But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Wilt thou kill me as thou didst uh, the Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses, then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. Now, what um, we learn here is this. Moses had perceived his call. God wanted him to be a leader. In fact, he was born for that purpose. And within him, he saw that call. Now you ask the question, how does a person know when he's called? How did Moses know that he was called? Let's look up here. Now, many people are confused. How do I perceive my call? Suppose I'm really called. How do I know? I do I know that it is not just that um, I'm making some supposition. Listen, Moses had great opportunities in Egypt. In the palace, he had a great opportunity. In fact, historians tell us that he had the opportunity to have ruled over Egypt. But there was something uppermost in his heart. That was to deliver the children of Israel. Listen to me that thing that was uppermost in his heart, there were times he will fight against it. He will shake it off. There were times he will try to set himself free from it. There were times he will think that it's impossible. I cannot. I will never be able to. But it was always in his heart. A strong impression. A definite impression. He couldn't shake it off. And you'll find something like that in your life. When God is calling you to do something, there will be that impression that you will not be able to shake off. It will be there, implanted there by the Holy Ghost. And uh, you may even want to try to forget it. There may be circumstances in your life that will make you to want to say, well, uh, let me not just think about it anymore. But off and on, it will be coming and coming and coming. Not only that. There will be alternatives for a man that is having a call. Now, the alternatives will be coming upon your mind. But every time you try to do that alternative, you'll be uneasy. You will not really be at ease. And every time you, you'll be saying, Okay, God, I think I see that you are calling me. That's perceiving the call. But not only that. If you are if you're having the call, there will be something within you. Without a congregation to preach to. Without any place where you will use that opportunity and actually fulfill the call. You will find yourself preparing to meet the need of that call. Every time. The call is there. 
it's impressed upon your heart and then you try to shake it off you cannot shake it off and then you'll find yourself every time trying to prepare for that call reading the bible waiting upon the lord and praying you'll be preparing for that call every time and it will be impossible to shake it up as you are preparing for the call that will lead you into getting saved if you were not saved before do you know there are people that just knew before they were ever saved that god needs them and wants to use them oh yes there are people like that and I can give you real experiences in my own life of uh, knowing that this is what I was supposed to do even before I knew what it meant to be born again. And now preparing for that call will make you to get into salvation. But you know, when you really have a call and it's impressed upon your heart, you will always see your shortcoming and you'll always be saying, will I be able to do it? Will I ever be able to fit in? That will lead you into sanctification. That will lead you into being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And you know that such a person having a call, that thing is impressed upon him and is getting himself prepared. He will be making use of opportunities that he has anytime. Any opportunity that he has outside or inside the church, which is legitimate, he will be making use of that opportunity. And he will feel the most, uh, the happiest person on earth whenever that opportunity is there. And these things will be showing him that you are having a call, you are perceiving the call, and you are preparing yourself to meet that call apart from that. When he does something, there may be maturity in what he does, there may be mistakes in what he does, there may be childishness in what he does, but the people within the congregation, they will be seeing that individual, they will be saying that uh, it looks like God's hand is upon this fellow. It looks like uh, whenever he talks, I am edified. And there will be that sense, that understanding within the congregation where you are using that call or where you are trying to perceive that call of usefulness. And then you will have a degree. Listen to me. You will have what we call a degree of utterance. You may not be a fluent speaker, but there will be a message inside you. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will always speak. Somebody to counsel, somebody to encourage, somebody to preach to, somebody to witness to. There will be all trans. You'll have some degree of all trans, even though it is not perfected yet. Not only that, there will be people that will be coming from, with testimonies that will shock you and surprise you. Saying, uh, I just thank God. And you'll be getting these testimonies at the time you are not even looking for them. Somebody just saying, well, I was helped when brother so-and-so, when sister so-and-so shared with me. And you are not conscious of it at all. All these things are just to tell you that the call of God is upon your life in that particular area or in this particular area. And you'll be careful that you are tailoring your lives in such a way that when the time really comes, you'll be ready. Now, Moses perceived the call. He knew it. But now the pity is this. He knew it when the people of Israel, when they had not known it. He perceived the call. He thought they will understand. And then because he thought they will understand, which they did not understand, he took a premature step. And he struck a premature blow. And then that led him to go into the wilderness. Please pay attention. I'm saying something now that is very, very essential for you. You know, some of us preachers, we try to forget our experiences of the past. We forget our difficulties in the past when we preach. And we just preach and preach and preach because now we have perceived the call and we have been given the opportunity to fulfill the call. But there are hundreds and thousands in the church who are just perceiving their calls and you need to be helped. Now listen to me. We do not need, listen, we do not need to go into any wilderness experience, but almost everybody goes into the wilderness experience. Why? Because what we call zeal is almost uncontrollable. What we call having a strong perception and a strong um, impact upon your life of wanting to fulfill the call of God upon your life, it's almost uncontrollable what we call the drive 
to be used of God, the drive to do something for God is almost uncontrollable. And you are not strange. It's almost like that for everybody. But it leads us into a wilderness experience. Now Moses perceived the call. The people had not perceived the call. And therefore, he did what he shouldn't have done. And uh, Pharaoh knew about it. When they were looking for him, they knew that uh, if uh, this thing came out and uh, they caught him, he'll be killed. Therefore, he ran away. That was not necessary. He didn't need to run away like that. If he didn't do what he did. But that's because the zeal was boiling within, boiling within him. The desire was boiling within him. And the understanding, the assurance that God had called him was definite within him. And because of that, he took a premature step. For 40 years, he was in the wilderness. And he suffered unnecessarily. And you know, for everybody, you'll dream about your call. You'll pray about your call. You'll want to do something about your call. You want to get active about your call. You'll be zealous about your call. And all that, all that may amount to you're doing something that your neighbors, your fellow believers, your own church, your people may not understand. And it may make you eventually, you know, they didn't drive Moses away. You know, he just lost his faith temporarily. Because actually, Pharaoh could not kill him. If he stayed there, Pharaoh could not kill him. Because God had called him. And what God wanted him to do, he will eventually do. But he didn't know that. Temporarily. Because he had been misunderstood. Temporarily. Because he had got himself into hot boiling water. He had to run away. He lost his confidence. He lost his faith. In fact, he forgot about the call. And you know, it happens to believers like that. And that's why you should be grateful you are in a church like this. Because here we try to help everybody, every member of the church. When you're overzealous, we'll cool you down. When you're running ahead of the time of God, we'll slow you down. When you're trying to be too loud and you're not quietly listening to God, we calm you down. And when we see that uh, you are, you know, just uh, trying to do things you shouldn't do, we just tell you, be patient, be patient. Your time is coming, be patient. Don't get into the wilderness experience. And it's so wonderful. And, um, you know, Moses got into this because he perceived his call, but then it wasn't God's time yet. We must never run ahead of the time of God. Now, he was in the wilderness and he was taking care of sheep. He was separated from Aaron, from his father, from his mother, from Miriam, from everybody else. And he went into a strange land that um, he was speaking a strange language. And he was given job to do. There he got married and there he got two children. Well, his marriage happened to be not totally perfect because he had problems inside that marriage. But that was part of the wilderness experience that he got himself into. But now he was at the burning bush. And I'm reading from Acts chapter 7, from verse 30. And when 40 years were expired, they appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai, an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wandered at the side, and he drew near to behold it. Uh, when he, as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled, and does not behold. Then said the Lord to him, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people, which is in Egypt, and I have heard their groaning, and I am come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send thee into Egypt." 
here he was given the commission and the Lord pronounced the commission but the Lord did it by a strange sight a burning bush that was not consumed that's a message in, in itself a bush burning with the fire of persecution with the fire of opposition it's a picture for Israel because you know Israel was in um, Israel was in Egypt do you know Egypt I mean have you ever read about Egypt if you want to think about the desert, Egypt, Egypt was a desert place. And even till now, the desert is pronounced there. And God brought this man to the backside of the desert. Where to show the picture of the children of Israel in Egypt, right in the desert land. And the fire was burning. The fire was burning. They were groaning. Because of the torment of that fire, they were groaning because of, the, because of the things they were going through. And do you know that yet they were not consumed? And God said, I have seen. I have seen. The affliction of the children of Israel. Come now. Think about that. Come now. He wanted to do it 40 years before, but God said, it's now I'm ready to send you. Come now, and I will send thee into Egypt. The Lord had not forgotten. You know that at this time, now Moses was not ready anymore. Moses was not willing anymore. And he started giving excuses. Why? Listen to me. When you have failed once, if you are not careful, that failure will build inside you an inferiority complex. When you have failed, your mind, if it's your renewed mind, will tell you you have done a permanent job. You'll never make it again. That's what your mind will say. That's what the devil will say. That's what your neighbors will say. But those who really love you will remind you, you might have failed once. You've not done a permanent job. If you can just bring that under the blood of Jesus Christ, that will be forgotten. And if you are listening, the Lord will call you again. Listen to me. There is nobody, nobody, no matter what mistakes he has made in the past, whom the Lord cannot call and commission again if he'll be yielded, if he'll be surrendered. Now, let's learn two things from that. Number one, Think about yourself. You were called. And you knew that call, you perceived the call, but then you took a wrong step. And that led you into the wilderness experience. And now, never, never think that the Lord has forgotten about that call. Whatever wilderness you go through, whatever problems you go through, the Lord will never forget. The Lord will call again. And the Lord can use you again. Say, the Lord can use me again. You know, that's wonderful. We learned when we were oh, little children, Jesus loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me so. But you know, I'm surprised when we come to the age of 15, we stop singing that song, we forget about it, and we feel, we, we, we still teach children, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. He loves little children, but we don't think that he loves us now, 40 years after that, as he loved us when we were in Sunday school as little children. But you know, he still does. He still does. And if he called you before and you took a wrong step, now he'll call you again if you're listening. That's the first lesson to learn. The second lesson to learn is this, and this one is harder. This one is harder. Look up here. If somebody has been called of God before, and because of zeal beyond knowledge, because of impatience, because of immaturity, because of childishness, he blew the top, he disappointed God, he did something that was wrong, something that was even outright sinful. And then he was so ashamed that he did, he took a wrong step. And uh, you know, we just forgot about him one year, two years, three years, ten years. 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Look up here. If the church is not careful, the church will never, never, never accept 
that after 40 years of wilderness experience, God can call that same man again into that same church and be used of God. And, you know, the church has really to follow the spirit before the church will understand that. For yourself, learn that. I'm not telling you to make a mistake. Eh, well, the reason I'm teaching you is so that you will avoid making mistakes. But then, if you have made mistakes in the past, the past is past. You'll be washed in the blood of Jesus. And remember that great is the faithfulness of our God. If you missed it before, he can call you again. So don't just uh, be discouraged and go into despair and condemning yourself. Well, I will never do it. You will do it if you believe you will do it. Because the calling and the selection of God is without repentance. If he called you before, he's calling you again. Only what you need to do now is to just consecrate yourself to the Lord and say, Oh God, I blew it before. I made a mistake before. I was immature before. Now I want to do it right this time. And you know, this is a, a church. And um, there might be members of our church because of immaturity. Or because of some a little thing they did, they themselves may, might have gone away. Now they want to come back to the church. You know, some time ago, uh, this year, about uh, three months ago or so, I, I was talking with somebody, not in this country, in another country. And um, in that other country, I saw this person who had left a deeper life for about seven to eight years. And you know what? Uh, the brother was telling me, a real child of God, in fact, over there where, where he is, is uh, doing something for the Lord. But his heart is still in deeper life. And uh, we were discussing together just a few months ago. And I said, uh, well, my brother, suppose I say we're expecting you. What do you think? And uh, he said, brother, I know you. I know that you... You'll never forget me. You always love people, even though I know you're strict and firm. But then I know that you never forget people. That if you were the only one in deeper life, if everybody in deeper life were like you, I'll just pack my load and come back immediately. But you know, I don't know what the people in deeper life would look like. Now you have, you have expanded more than well, eight years, seven years ago. But, um, well, I don't know what I will do. And I said, my brother deeper life is just like I am. And they accept me as a leader. And if I say we are welcoming you back, everybody will just say praise the Lord. Am I right? Yes. You see, we should learn that. We should learn that. And the same thing with your own children. Now your children may, may just blow the top, just do evil, and they run away. You just accept them back whenever they are coming back. When they come back, don't say, well, you naughty fellow, you dirty fellow, you foolish fellow. Just accept them back if they are repenting and coming back to the fold. Now this is what we're learning from the life of uh, Moses. Now, we've seen his childhood, he was protected. We've seen his call, he perceived it. We've seen his commission, it was pronounced. Now, let's see the conquest. Verses 35 and 36. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the, of the angel, which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that, he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness 40 years. Now, Moses was to conquer. But then, you know, before he will get into the land of Canaan with the people, before he will start taking them to the land of Canaan, he must still conquer the enemies that will hinder their going in there. He was significantly used in carrying out the plan of God. The ultimate goal was the conquest of Canaan. But first... There had to be the conquest over the gods, the idols of Egypt. That's the reason for all those miracles that took place in Egypt. And also there had to be conquest over Pharaoh's will, over Pharaoh's army, over the Red Sea, over the dry and the dreary land, the dreary wilderness, and then over a stubborn, disobedient nation. And you know that um, as we study the life of Moses, as recited by Stephen, we've learned so much. 
And tonight I've reminded you that in our call, we should be patient, we should be prayerful, just following the Lord step by step. And while you're trying to follow the call, don't leave your church behind. I mean this church. And you know if God has called you, the Bible says he has set in the church. Let's see that. He has set in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 28, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. You know, you must understand that God wants you to work in the context of the church. The church. Now, you don't want to go out to fulfill your call and surround yourself with sinners, with unbelievers. You don't want to surround yourself with people who are not the church of God, the church of the living God, because God has set some in the church. If God is calling you to be an apostle, a prophet, a teacher, a pastor, an evangelist, a soul winner, if God is calling you to be something, to do the work of the Lord in the church, it will be that God is setting you up in in the church in the church in the church in Ephesians chapter 4 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. You know, you should never carry out your call in a way that the body is divided, the body is not edified, the body is not built up. If God is calling a man to be an apostle, to be a prophet, or to be an evangelist, or to be a pastor, or to be a teacher, it is for this purpose, for the perfecting of the saints. But you think about it, that when you have the call, like Moses, like I've been talking to you tonight, the zeal, the fervency will almost, almost always result into impatience and immaturity and pushing down everybody, getting the church divided, not perfecting the saints. Don't do that. Don't do that. There should be nothing selfish about carrying out your call, carrying, it, carrying out my call. Because he has given all these offices in the church and is calling the people into various areas of the work for the perfecting, perfecting, perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. Just one ministry. Because, you know, at that, at that time, there wasn't, you know, this denomination, that denomination, that denomination. It was just one church, one doctrine, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And you know, he's calling us and he's saying it's for the work of the ministry and for the edifying, for the building up of the body of Christ. And so uh, from tonight you've seen we can have the call of God. The time you perceive it, at that time you need to take extra care so that by immaturity, by childishness, by impatience, you don't run yourself into a terrible wilderness experience. I believe the Lord has spoken to us tonight. And he wants us to take these things to him in prayer. So that the Lord will make us what we ought to be. Rise up and let us pray. Tell the Lord about yourself. If you've made a mistake in the past, you tell the Lord. He'll forgive. He'll cleanse. He'll wash you with the blood of Jesus. Then let there be patience in your life. There is a time to be quiet, a time to be patient, a time to be slow. You tell the Lord from what we have learned in the life of Moses. Tell the Lord. If you are perceiving the call, get prepared. A show of your salvation. 
Press on and be sanctified. Press on and be baptized in the Holy Ghost. Press on in the study of the scriptures. Press on in consecration. Yielding everything to the Lord. Press on. Count the Lord faithful. Don't take a wrong step. Don't let immaturity or impatience destroy the plan of God for your life. Follow the Lord steadily on. Open your heart to the Lord. Settle everything with Him. And to be ready for the call, literally submit yourself to the learning of the scriptures. If you are not sanctified yet, you know it. You tell the Lord. Let self be crucified. The Adamic nature uprooted. Tell the Lord to cleanse you with the blood of Jesus. He will. You get something definite from the Lord tonight. You want to go back home with an assurance of salvation. With a definite experience of sanctification. You want the power of the Holy Ghost to fill your life. You want to take a decision to actually study the Bible and consistently carry through.